So colleagues, I am delighted to officially open the seventh webinar series being held under the theme, Effective Financial Leadership, the Platform for Economic Growth and Personal Development. This session will undoubtedly provide us with a wealth of knowledge and strategies that will enable us to make sound financial decisions for ourselves and for our organizations. Platforms of this nature are imperative and will open the door for us to have fruitful discussions that will help to enhance our operations and promote personal growth and development. The college remains committed in facilitating these sessions as together we strive to make our contributions to Jamaica, realizing its National Development Plan Vision 2030, a place of choice to live, work, raise family, do business, and I will add, retire. At this time, I am pleased to invite our permanent secretary, Mr. Dean Roy Bernard, in the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information, to bring welcome and greetings. Could we just applaud Mr. Bernard as he comes? Thank you. Thank you very much, the ever hardworking and vibrant and vivacious Dr. Tanisha Ingleton. Let me greet our hardworking Minister of Education, Youth and Information, Senator Ruel Reed, Senator Aubin Hill, CEO Economic Growth Council, and I'm sure you'll be appropriately recognized at a later time. Uh, we have Dr. Grace McLean, our Chief Education Officer, always present but sometimes hidden. Again, Dr. Tanisha Ingleton in your capacity as Director Principal for the National College for Educational Leadership. Dr. Anel Bellany, Educational Specialist, IDB. Ms. June Pinto, Department of Government, UA, Senior Administrator. I have also on my list of persons to be recognized, Dr. Renee Rattray. I think she may be on her way, Jamaica National Foundation. Dr. Diana, with her long steps, would be on way as well. We have our senior officers and directors in our ministry, Ministry of Education, Youth and Information. I see Ms. This is Donalds and Ms. Carr, National Parenting Support Commission. I see other officers, hardworking men and women um, from the ministry and other departments of government. Nevertheless, we are all distinguished guests, and we are laid together, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. It is my pleasure to welcome all of us to another public education and trans information sharing webinar organized by the National College for Educational Leadership. This webinar is being hosted in keeping with NCEL's mandate to support the thousands of school leaders, teachers, and others in our schools and across the landscape of our ministry and Jamaica as a whole. While policymakers and others have specific important roles to play in helping to enhance the teaching and learning experience in our schools, ultimately the key players are those within our institutions who guide everyday practice and the management of school plans. The Ministry of Education, Youth and Information through NCEL is therefore committed to supporting the practice of leadership in various forms across the educational system. NCEL is therefore committed to managing change, to managing structures, hierarchies, and accountabilities. 
we must ensure that as we do so, we consider capacity building, creativity, teamwork, organizational redesign, collaboration, flexibility, networking, and indeed transformation. The Ministry of Education, Youth and Information through NCEL exists to make a difference through the development of leadership and that difference is about improvement in educational outcomes. It's about strengthening and deepening leadership qualities, building professional learning communities, and improving life chances for our children. As we say in the ministry, the ultimate, the ultimate goal is for the advancement of those who learn at our feet. As NCEL continues to create new knowledge and positively transform the way educational leaders, their organizations, and their teams confront the education-related challenges of the 21st century, the introduction of these leadership development webinars take on added significance. And may I say, Dr. Ingleton, I am thinking that this would be about the fourth, the seventh in the series of webinars. So, Mr. Senator Hill, there is a significance about the number seven. There is a completeness um, about that. No pressure, Senator. <laughs> the series which focuses on the principles, processes, and practices of leading and the way leadership development is conceived, conducted, and evaluated seek to explore, analyze, and evaluate potential solutions to problems of practice especially with respect to financial leadership. And you will hear me doing a little pepping in that regard as I speak about practice and problem solving. Under the theme, Effective Financial Leadership, the platform for economic growth and the personal development, which be delivered by Senator Orbit Hill, Chief Executive Officer, we can further advance our understanding of what is required in leadership and school improvement programs. I repeat, we are speaking with a platform for economic growth and personal development. May I therefore welcome you all as we listen to our presenters and see how best we can apply the ideas shared to individual institutions. Today is another day that we will celebrate as we move to transform education and to transform this beautiful land that we love, as we move towards achieving the 2030 vision. And you said it, Dr. Ingerton, we want to really, at our age, have the Jamaica at a place in 2030 when we can retire in peace. Thank you very much. Colleagues, we will now welcome our Honorable Minister, Senator, the Honorable Ruel Reed, our Minister, to the podium to introduce Senator Aubin Hill. Could we do that, colleagues? Thank you very much, Dr. Ingleton, our host and director principal and um, of course I will do some pep talking to figure out how do we properly align those two positions. Um, my colleague Senator, brother and friend, Senator Aubin Hill, Permanent Secretary, Mr. Dean Roy Bernard, to our special guest, Mr. Duane Burbick, to all other officers of the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information, or heads of agencies, senior officers, other distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, pleasant good afternoon. Man is indeed a task to introduce Senator Hill to this very seminal topic. And um, quite my background is also in um, in management, so when I see 
effective financial leadership, platform for economic growth and personal development. Um, a lot of context for a lot of what our students will have to be exposed to, whether in math at the primary level, um, in business subjects at the secondary and tertiary level. So for us, even as practitioners, you know, a lot of times they thought that teachers don't know about money management, don't know about economic growth issues, know about the linkages, how do we fit, how do we manage our own personal finances and so on. So this is a very, um, very, I thought, most appropriate um, session. So I'm glad to be here and to engage in this activity. As stakeholders in the profession that teaches all professions, we have to constantly sharpen our craft. I think I can recall where I thought I did a fairly good job at Monroe and I went there as an econ, social studies teacher, Caribbean studies teacher, sociology teacher, um, because I came into education out of the private sector and a lot of my teaching was very practical. I could draw on a lot of my, my experiences. Um, if we do not, we will uh, most certainly become like salt losing its savor. I believe we all know what happens to salt that lose its savor. So ladies and gentlemen, the theme, therefore, effective financial leadership, the platform for economic growth and personal development is most timely. Um, as leaders in education, we have to ensure that we are familiar with the latest financial information and strategies to help us remain good stewards of public and private resources. Like Caesar's wife, we must be above suspicion. Colleagues, while more financial and other resources have been put in our education system over the last two years, a lot of money that uh, principals are not accustomed to seeing so much money. Um, there are plans to allocate more, yes. We have to guard closely our utilization of existing resources, the impact, efficiency, impact in terms of using resources most bang for the buck because there can't be no wastage. We need to constantly remi rem remind ourselves that prudent management of personal and public financial resources are indeed indices of our overall ability to lead. Ladies and gentlemen, even uh, you are the most, if you are the most charismatic education leader in the world, if you neglect the proper management of public and private financial resources, you quote problems. So I'm glad that the National College for Educational Leadership is equipping our education stakeholders with critical information to make them, to make you do a better job. When our leaders in education are better at their jobs, there, in fact, is a ripple effect on the wider economy, which translates into further needed improvements in economic growth and job creation, and the lifting of more of our brothers and sisters out of poverty into prosperity. I'm glad that this afternoon I'm able to introduce a colleague who is most experienced and most appropriate to guide our thoughts and to empower us in this particular endeavor. I can attest that Senator Aubin Hill is no mere theorist. Senator Hill is by all account a financial specialist who has done the real hard-nosed practical work of successfully resurrecting individuals. So if you are here and need financial resurrection, you have the savior um, to help you. Company finances have been resurrected by him, many across the world, and I'm therefore glad to introduce him. As the Chief Executive Officer of Corporate Strategies Limited, Senator Hill has over 35 years work and experience in the private sector. In the early 1980s, he led a startup team to open a branch of American Express International Bank and Corporation, AEIBC, in Sri Lanka, and success there led to promotion to Amex Bank in Bren. Prior to his work in Sri Lanka, Senator Hill had worked with Amex Bank in New York, Rome, and Mumbai. He has lived in seven plus 
Two, how much is that? All right, pep question. And um, he has lived in nine countries and done businesses more than a hundred in more than 115. So note that. So he lived in nine countries and did business in how many? Okay, so how much is the average amount of... Um... <laughs> All right, good. It's a pep question. During his 21 years as a bank in the Middle East, Senator Hill assisted in and led to the restructuring of two major banks, the Bergen Bank in Kuwait and the National Bank of Oman, where he served as CEO. He also led the management team that completed the successful turnaround of one of the largest banks in the Caribbean. Anybody tell me that? The one building a better Jamaica? What's, what's the name of that one? The National Commercial Bank. In 10 plus 9 months, Senator Hill, how many months is that? Okay, very good. His team moved the NCB stock price from five $5.51, $5.51 when he joined to when he left to 31.70. So again, another pep question here to calculate what is overall profit moving from 5.51 to 31.70. So write that down and you can give the answer later. Market capitalization of the NCB moved from $13.5 billion to $78.2 billion in two years, and profits increased from $330 million to $3.2 billion during the same period. He's established Corporate Strategies Limited as a management consultancy firm in 2005. The firm has done work for many of Jamaica's very large corporations. Between 2005 and October 2011, Senator Hill led the divestment team, which successfully divested the loss-making government-owned sugar assets, which consisted of five sugar factories and six estates. In June 2014, the leader of the opposition, then um, now Prime Minister, uh, both Honorable Andrew Holness, appointed Senator Hill to chair the newly established Economic Advisory Council. Senator Hill sits on various corporate boards, including that of the Jamaica Brawlers Group, the Limited, the largest food processing company in the Caribbean, Salada Food Jamaica Limited, Petro Carib Development Fund. He also serves on the University Council. Uh, which governs four campuses of the University of the West Indies. In April of 2016, Senator Hill was appointed by the newly elected government to serve as chairman of both the National Water Commission and the National Irrigation Commission. And don't harass him about any water problem this afternoon. In March 2016, the Prime Minister appointed Senator Hill to Jamaica's upper house. When I was teaching social studies, I told them that we have, we have a bicameral parliament. You know that? We have the lower house and the upper house. And there are how many members in the lower house? And how many in the upper, and the upper house? 21. All right, good. So he was elected. Um, he was appointed, not elected. He was appointed to the upper house and uh, appointed as deputy president of the Senate. So the man is a big man in every sense of the word. The prime minister gave him even more work and appointed him as a special investment ambassador to one of the largest countries, in, one of the largest populated countries in the world. In fact, it is the largest, I would say, English-speaking country in the world. Anybody know that country? Hello, hello, hello. People who, a lot of IT people. India. Oh, come on, you're going to get a prize for that. He also served as Chief Technical Advisor as the Minister of Finance from March 2016 to September 2017. In October 2017, Senator Hill was chosen as the CEO of the Prime Minister's Economic Growth Council. Senator Hill speaks on finance, business management and economics at international conferences and seminars in a number of countries including Trinidad and Tobago. His wife is from Trinidad and Tobago, by the way. Oh, yeah. What I think she's from, um, oh, I know I'm mixing up. I, it is, it's Bruce. No, and it's uh, Bruce I saw the weekend. His wife is from Sri Lanka. Yes. Um, right, so his wife is from Sri Lanka. Um, he has, so he has done these seminars in Sri Lanka, Bahamas, Antigua, uh, USA, Sri Lanka, and India. He's, uh, and he's a Monroe graduate, by the way. And that qualified him for further academic qualification for the MBA 
from the erudite Harvard Business School. So, uh, with all of that, he has found time to marry his wife Tamara and has two grown children. Ladies and gentlemen, it's therefore my greatest pleasure to interview, into introduce my good, <laughs> my good friend and colleague, Senator Orbin Hill. Thank you very much. <laughs> my good friend, uh, Senator the Minister, really. Um, could have skipped half of that. But thank you very much. My mother, dead as she is, would be very proud. Um, Minister, P.S., Dr. McLean, Dr. Ingleton, holy of other doctors, the P.S. was just boasting to me that he was talking to the P.S. in, in um, health and said, you can count as many doctors as you want. I have more than you. <laughs> so, <laughs> the PS of doctors. <laughs> um, I'm very pleased to be here this afternoon. Um, I'll take you through a general picture, a broader, bigger picture of countries, then get down to personal finance. Because I understand that um, you are in a place in various positions in education where Yes, you educate. Yes, you mark papers. Yes, you encourage and teach young people. But you also have to manage the money. If you don't manage the money, you get mixed up in auxiliary fees and fees and all kind of stuff. So I'm here this evening to talk to you a little bit about the money. And this is where I want to start. I want to start with the relevance of what you do in terms of knowledge. When I came back to Jamaica in 2002 to run NCB, one of the first loans I had to look at was, it's now public, so Digicel is big, so I can say it. We don't normally talk about loans in public. We gave the first $27 million to Digicel, believe it or not, NCB. They weren't the billion dollar company that they are today. They needed a lot of Dollars and we gave them 27 million US as a loan, which they have paid back many, many times, clearly. But what that did was allowed Jamaica to move from a place where, like India and Sri Lanka and other uh, developing countries, you had to wait five years to get a landline, if you're lucky. Well, when we gave Digicel that money, and in a few short years, one of the most popular politicians I know, and one of whom I like very much, is now dead. Roger Clark could say, hello, 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 hello. I have two phones, <laughs> and they both work. <laughs> what that money and Digicel did to Jamaica is to allow us to leapfrog from a, a moribund, backward, couldn't work telephone system to one where you, you, can't, you can't incrementalize that. The leapfrogging was critical for many of the things that you now do in universities and schools and on the internet. So certain things you cannot incrementalize. You must leapfrog. And where we are in terms of our development and where we must get in terms of providing jobs for people crafting economies sitting in your bedroom or in your car on your computer and today your phone is a computer I mean the phone that you have now Fortran 20 years ago uh, with half, half making about half of this room could not compute half of what is on your phone today so where we must go in terms of development is critical that we leapfrog and only knowledge can leapfrog poor people from poverty to prosperity, and that's not a political statement. Honestly, it's not. I, I um, have been all of my life about seeing how I can make people's lives better through finance 
and making things available for them, whether it was in Oman, um, Kuwait is rich. Oman is quite rich, but Kuwait is really rich. Uh, India, wherever else I would have worked, and in Jamaica, of course. So we must use knowledge, your product, the products that you create to leapfrog, from, have Jamaica move from where we are, and we have far too many poor people still. Far too many. We must have knowledge, and honestly, a little person in, I'm from a wonderful little district called Southfield in St. Elizabeth. Anytime you hear me talk, St. Elizabeth is gonna come up sometime or other. So all three, four times. So that's one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> where we have ordinary people who are now learning a great deal of knowledge and it's you in the education system who must provide them with this tool to leapfrog. You cannot leapfrog poverty without knowledge. You cannot leapfrog poverty to anything better than poverty without knowledge. You are at a critical place as teachers, as educators, as persons who are enabling the educational process in our country to make sure that you can help our population leapfrog. Because you know something? When you have that knowledge, I saw recently where the highest paid guy who handles, is it robotics or some other amazing stuff that he's doing, is from Nigeria in his 20s. You go on my Twitter page, I've, I tweeted it. So you, the Twitter page is Hill, Hill Orbin, I think, at Hill Orbin. When you follow me. I put all kinds of things on it. Some people get upset, and I sit back and I laugh, and <laughs> no, that's not true. But, <laughs> but if you follow me, you will never be disappointed. I got the full gamut of in information. Sports, whatever it is. So here you are. A young man in Nigeria, his name tells me that he's Christian Nigerian. He's a Christian name, and if you're a Muslim, you will not have a Christian name. So I know he's a, he's a Christian. So he's a minority in Nigeria, the best paid guy in the world doing what he does. He's in his 20s. Now, in, in 50 years ago, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, a black guy like that couldn't be that. It would be somebody else looking somebody, somewhere different. Because you know what? You would have to see him. No, you don't have to see him. You have to see his work. Okay, knowledge, Dr. Nisha. Knowledge, Mr. Minister, where you have been spending your life, did so well at Monroe and wrap up JC, and I'm still a quarrel with you. <laughs> so life go. So when we look at that, I want to say to you, even before I get into formal presentation, you, are, you have something in your hands that can really change your country. It's called knowledge. Use it to help our country to leapfrog. Because let me tell you something. No matter how much mining we do in St. Elizabeth, no matter how much transport we do, no matter what else you do, if you don't have the knowledge, you cannot leapfrog. You're going to incrementalize. Let's go to the slides. Who's doing it for me? Wonderful. Give me the point. I can't point myself. <laughs> where, where is it? Oh. Thank you very much. I think I know how to do this. It works in reverse. A funny thing. So, what is the most important thing about a leader? And those of you from the Economic Growth Council can answer. I said to you here. You can't answer that question. What is the most important thing about the leader? Nobody get upset. Just put up your hand and tell me. What do you think? Honesty. You're right. Next. Come on, man. Motivate your Must be able to motivate people. Next. What? Be a servant. Be a servant. You, she's into the servant leadership. Me too. And that's not the other me too. This is just me too. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Next. What else? You must have a vision. You don't have no vision, the people perish. 
Must be able to build partnership. Must be a person of integrity. All those are right. Now watch this. You're going to get to the fish head soon. Who are you going to be honest to? Who are you going to give a vision to? The first characteristic of a leader is that you must have followers. Who are you going to lead? If you run ahead of your followers, you don't have no follower. If you're like a president who they accuse of leading from behind, you don't have no follower. The first definition of a leader, you must have followers. So when you want to lead, what is it that I'm conveying? How do I get people to follow me? Yes, I must be honest. Yes, I must have integrity. Yes, I must have vision. And can I put those together to have a fellowship? So that's the first definition of a leader. As you lead in your areas, are you really de leading? Or you just have the job because somebody gave it to you? So you know, as I said, I lived in Saint, I live in Saint Louis. I grew up there. Second mention. That's two. I live near Monroe College, about 2,000 feet up, salubriously wonderful. I just came back from this weekend. Beautiful, no air conditioning in my house. Lovely and sweet and pretty, and the rainfall is lovely. But I go down to the beach at Treasure Beach, about 20 minutes, and I look at the fish. And let me tell you something about leadership. Leaders must lead. You have to have followers, and you must lead. And that means somebody has to head up something. And when I go down to Treasure Beach, I have never seen a fish stink from the tail. The tail wrinkle up in the sun, and the fish stinks from the head. So when you're the leader, are you a stinking leader, or you're a leader, or you're no leader at all? The fish doesn't stink from the tail. Nobody blame your people who follow you. Nobody blame the people who you are authorized to lead and to guide and to give a vision and be honest to. The fish stings from the head. If you're heading and you're not leading and you're not getting results, the fish is stinking. And if you're the head, you are the stinker. So that's the general. Now I told you I'm going to go to the big picture. In 2013, no. For 40 years before that, we borrowed money that we could never, ever afford. We borrowed money. I can't find the hospitals. I can't find enough schools. I didn't see the road. Where did the money go? We waste it. We take it and buy all kinds of consumer stuff that all of us, I wasn't here, so it must be you. <laughs> <laughs> Can't blame me for that one. I wasn't here. <laughs> so we borrowed all that money, and we didn't see the investment for it. But you know something? The, the things came home to roost in 2013. We couldn't get, go anywhere. In fact, it's not 2013, even before that, a few years before that. But in 2013, we had a debt to GDP of 147%. Greece has a, a, a debt to GDP of 172%. And let me tell you how the world is here. The world is level. You can call whatever you want. Our 147% debt to GDP got the IMF to stuff 7.5% uh, primary surplus down our throat. In fact, it was in this room after they met that I met them the first time with the governor and the rest of them right in this room. 7.5%, the highest primary surplus that any country ever had. No. Greece was up at 177. Today, Greece is 180% debt to GDP. At 177, you know how much for them debt to GDP was? 4.5, which is what the best economists um, advising the IMF at the time said it should have been. It shouldn't, shouldn't be higher. But that's how it is, the world on a level. Whatever you want to interpret on that, you go to interpret it. Just I give you the facts, okay? Are you facts, Mr. Demi? Write from the paper. 
me check it. So you find out that the, the situation that we were in, because we were profligate, because we borrowed what we, we didn't earn, because we weren't earning enough, is a situation that you can get into as a school, as a university, as a person. Learn from Jamaica and learn, say the world, no level. Okay, this is a lady have influence and friend in the NCB and she get good loan at low price. You baby, you come from St. Elizabeth like me, them say your country not get nothing <laughs> except high rates. So life go even with Greece and Jamaica. So don't be surprised when the world on a level. What you must do is look after yourself so you don't become like Greece and Jamaica or Iceland in 2010 or Ireland in 2010. Are you running your school in such a measure? Are you running the institution which you lead? Or are you being a little bit like a fish head in, 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 in Treasure Beach in a hot day? Financial management is critical at every level. Jamaica was assisted by the IMF and other multilateral partners to steady the Jamaican ship at a huge cost. Just under $60 billion of taxes in four years. That's a huge burden. 7.5% primary surplus. That means you don't have no money left to invest, no road, no nothing. That's what that means. Because, because we had to pay down our debt. Remember now, no. the head of IMF tell you, Mrs. Lagarde, she not into growth, she not do growth, she do fiscal arrangements. Fiscal consolidation was the case in our case. We had to consolidate. They're not here to help you grow. We must grow our economy. So we, if, we, if we have to pay all that debt, how on earth are we going to pay, uh, grow? We have to find other ways. So you have little or no economic growth. And we're trying to get out of that thing. The same thing will happen to the school. You can't build a lab. You can't build the new toilets that you need. You can't build no new changing room for your athletes. You can't do anything extra. You just have to go from hand to mouth. And sometimes the hand can't reach them out. You have to manage your financial activities very, very well. We had a large. I'm going to take you now to NWC. You must have heard about the fact that we went to market for $15 billion Jamaican dollars. Why? When I went to NWC, Horace Chang, the then minister under whom water came, said, look, you have to go in there and help fix the financial uh, arrangements in NWC. We have lots of things to fix in NWC. In fact, I can tell you in two or three years' time, you won't recognize the same NWC, but I don't want to make any big prediction yet. Since it's the prime minister, minister, he must talk. Okay, me up here to talk about the $15 billion, all right? We know my place. So we talk, <laughs> why we went to get Jamaican dollars? When I went, I looked at the balance sheet, and there's a whole heap of foreign debt in euros, in US dollars, all kind of hard currency. And the only currency we get paid in is a weak currency called Jamaican dollars. Foolishness. FX101 tells you, you see that? FX101. We did the exact opposite of what they're telling the first finance class you go to. You borrow in a weak currency and you earn in a high currency. We did the exact opposite. It's not NWC do it alone. The whole country do it. So we go in there and say, this is nonsense. So we call up, put out the bid for four people. Them yeah, people will tell us that we never got a bid, but it's not true. We got a bid. Four people, we ask. Two come back. One said they want government guarantee, because that's all they've had for 40 years. We're not into that. We're not giving you no government guarantee. None of that. IMF no want it, and me worse. Me and them agree at least one thing. No government guarantee. So we looked at this, and... We had hundreds of millions of US dollars. So we borrow 15 billion, we pay off some of the US dollar, pay off the euro. We had, were paying foreign currency debt 
at 9.77% foreign currency. That means in four years, we paid $7.5 billion, not in interest, in foreign exchange losses with not one drop of water for it. Absolute foolishness. That's how your country is run. We must get involved more in what's going on in the country. As so we run the country, we borrow all this money, we, the devaluation hit us $7.5 billion and not one drop of water. So we changed that. We, we borrowed money, not only did we borrow Jamaican dollars, we borrowed Jamaican dollars for 40 years, unheard of by utility. The balance sheet of NWC, them said couldn't take it well. When me and the bank, them meet and me rub with them, because I led it. I, that's a, I, the management runs the place, but the board asked me to lead this because clearly it's expertise that I have. And I work with the management and I work with the banks and we got the 40 year, 40 years to pay back. That's how utility borrow. That means in a devaluing currency in a few four years, the money is for free. But I'll tell you how that works later on. <laughs> FX 101, I move over that already. We borrowed the money, we move on. And I'm telling you that so that when you go into your school or your university, or wherever you go to, to run, go look at the financial arrangements. Look at the financial arrangements. You can do many things if you restructure it, if it's not structured properly. Why it won't move? Ah, here we go. Oh, I want to take a few minutes. Yeah. Mr. Music Man, you can run this for me? Here you go. I'm going to take a few minutes and have you listen to the man who Business Week called the single best manager of the century, the last century. What is the role His name is Jack Welch. From GE. Well, the first one clearly is to be the chief meaning officer. The chief meaning of To let everyone in the place know where you're going, why you're going there, and most importantly, what's in it for them to get there with you. People like to talk about where they're going, why they're going there, but they don't, they always leave out the third thing. When you come into a new job, you say, we want to change. Change is great, we got to do it. You forget. People hate change. You explain <laughs> what's in it for them. To Ask the minister. <laughs> so be the chief meaning officer and give meaning to every one of those people that are out there doing that job, so that they understand why you're going where you're going. That means the ministers too. What's in it for them? To get All job, of us. More pay, more flexibility, maybe nothing. If you can't say nothing. But you gotta understand that's one of them. Another part of a job, your job is to not give all these directives and not be the person getting rid of the clutter. Getting rid of clutter is a huge deal. You can't all of a sudden have bureaucracy. Let's go here, let's go there. They have 20 rules to stop the employees from getting there. You've got to break down all those little silos that occur, all those little bureaucrats who, do, who are checking the boxes in some layers, slowing you down. You've got to be the person in the, we always use this analogy of curling. You see it every four years in, in, in the Olympics with the broom out in front of the thing. You've got to be brewing away the stuff that's in the way. You've got to be the chief broomer out there to get rid of things so people can act and do things. You've got to have, if you want to be, in my experience, and I've looked at thousands of managers in my lifetime, you've got to have a generosity gene. It's got to be in your body. You've got to love to see people promoted. You can't, you can't have a jealous vein where you, you can't, oh, Joe got promoted and I should have got that job, or Mary got this and Pete should have got it, or whatever. You've got to enjoy people's success. You gotta love people's success. You gotta get in their skin and really be excited as hell for them. You gotta love to give raises. You gotta be turned on giving bonuses. You gotta make you feel great. And not, geez, I gave him a bonus and I didn't get one that big. 
And none of those feelings. You gotta just get over them. And if I look at all the leaders I've seen, the best ones I've seen have this generosity gene. I ask yourself, do you have it? Or do you have a little small gene in there that's killing you and give raises, killing you to see other successes and jealous in your body? You can't have it. Brush it out, clean it out. And then do you go to work every day, finally, to really have fun? Are your people having fun? Make, find all kinds of ways to win. There are small victories all the time and celebrate every one of them. We found a way to bring a keg in on everything. <laughs> uh, find a way, find a way to make little victories big victories. And if you get a lot of little victories, you'll get a big victory when you add them all together. But think of the job that way. Work is fun. And your job is to make it fun if you're a leader. Don't be some grinding horse's ass. <laughs> if you're a boss, slap yourself. Think of the excitement and fun you can have in your job. Make it fun. Be the chief fun officer. So in my view, you've got a huge responsibility, most of you. God gave you a job where you are responsible for people's lives. It's a big deal. You got families you're responsible for? Make it a big success for them. You got one of the luxuries of life to impact people's lives. Grab it, squeeze it, and take advantage of it. What is the role of a leader? Well, the first one clearly is to be the chief meaning officer to let everyone in the place know where you're going, why you're going. But I think you, you can get it. That's um, when I was starting my, uh, biz, my career from business school, Jack Welch was um, just into his role at, at GE, and he changed that company from, I think, like $38 billion to $400 billion market cap. He was easily the most outstanding manager of the last century. But here you have some wise words from him. The thing that I like about it, the second part, part was a clutter, which I'll, which I'll equate a little bit with the Economic Growth Council. We have developed, and I see Cordell here, she's now going to remind me that I have to be the chief fund officer as well, which I will quite happily download to her. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, but in terms of looking, when I joined the Economic Growth Council in October, uh, Mike Leachin and the team before me had done a tremendous job. You remember that for four years, all you could hear about was fiscal consolidation and a measure of taxes. But every speech was fiscal consolidation. Bert, Bert Steiner, whatever his name was from the IMF, then Uma, fiscal consolidation. You fiscal till you're dead and consolidate forever. No growth. None of that. The Economic Growth Council was established by the Prime Minister who became the Minister of Economic Growth and Job Creation. He put Michael Leach in there, and you know, Mike is bigger than life. I know him very well. Mike not do anything ordinary. So Mike go up there and said, look, <laughs> I was talking to him after, afterwards. He said, if I go up there, Aubin, and talk about 2% growth, what is 2% growth? Who cares about 2%? So Mike go up there and pop it up 5% in four years. No, I mean, no, how the Prime Minister heart. <laughs> manage that when you hear it from the, from the TV and the radio. But well, I put it so Mike, five and four, and we're, gonna, we're heading for it. We, ha we want to have it. So the conversation changed. Mike changed that conversation, he and his team, from all the taxman now talk about growth. Teachers talk about economic growth, whereas before we talk about fiscal consolidation and debt. So is so a debt. All some people dead from it. <laughs> True, Finsack killed some. So 
we change the conversation. Now, when I came in, I said, okay, conversation is change. Growth is something I completely supported as the chairman of the then leader of the opposition's um, economic um, advisory council. We discussed it, we talked about it, we want to have, have it happen. So how do you make it happen? Well, you can have lots of meetings and you can talk as much as you want. So we looked at, I said, there's a dichotomy in growth and I'm talking to teachers so I can use all this kind of fancy word. You know? Cordell didn't like it when I started off. <laughs> so, but she's now comfortable with it. She just leave, she leaves me alone now, so I can use it. So we have this dichotomy where you have the enablers on one side and the implementers on one side. Sometimes enablers began to believe that they were implementers. The government doesn't do economic growth. And if it happens by chance, it's purely by chance, and if they plan it, it never works. You want me to tell you some countries who plan it, and you want to see them where them there today? Well, me now call their name because some of them are my friend. <laughs> so, but you can take your own pick. Go look at what planning the economy has done. The government properly run those agencies, the Economic Growth Council, the Ministry of, of Education, the, all the, the, the agencies in the Ministry of Education are enablers. NEPA is an enabler. NCC is an en enabler. NWC is an enabler. You can't get your house built unless you get the water approval from NWC. If them tie it up, you don't get the house built. And enablers, by definition, if you are not enabling, you are a blocker. I need 10 forms. And you only bring me nine. And the last one needs a signature. Take them all back. And when you have them, bring them back. And she's, because it's usually a she, because she, a hold for more woman employed and man. <laughs> no, 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 blame, blame me for this. A hold for more employment. But all of them, some of us man, and some of the women them, screw up them face by you and say, bring back the form when you have only one. Well, you go to Dubai, Sheikh Mohammed, you go to Sheikh Mohammed's place. You, before you, first of all, if you want 10 form, you fill up the thing from Jamaica on your computer. You turn up there and you, the lady will greet you, beautiful smile, sometimes it's a man too, and greet you and they say, Mr. Hill, welcome to Dubai. We're pleased to see you here and that you're going to invest in Dubai. We've looked at your form. There's one item that you need a notary public in Dubai for and on Sheikh Khalid Street, which is three blocks down, you can get any notary public you want. And by the time you get back here at about 10 o'clock, Mrs. Johnson, I'll have all the approvals for you. That is enabling. Anytime you're in the business of your business and you're not doing that, you're a blocker. So leave today and go out there and be an enabler. You know something else? They're going to give you another charge. Every time you see a government person who prepares like a blocker, tell them, get it and write about it. Me not taking no nonsense. I am going to compliment you. I'm going to be praiseworthy of you. But if you're a blocker, you're going to hear from me because you know what? A Femi country too. And you're mashing it up. And unless we get like that, our country cannot change. Let's hold ourselves to higher accountability. And you know something this thing about that me now offend anybody. Now offend anybody. You mash up my country. What do you mean me now offend you? Get upset about it. So that's what. Well, I want to pick out a Jack Welsh. Clear out the clutter. We'll talk about rewarding people. This is not a private sector enterprise, but I used to have a pleasure. The three top division heads, maybe I have 10 or 12, depending on the bank, when the end of the year would come and they're outstanding, I don't wait for the evaluation. I call the HR and said, well, this is what Tarek has done, da, 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 da. This is the money draw check. I walk up to Tarek's office, I'm surprised, I'm seeing me, I say, Tarek, here's a check for you. Here's a bonus, you've done an outstanding job. But that's only for this year. Next year it could be different. I don't want him to get the impression that another check coming next year, unless you perform, <laughs> is for one year. P hold people accountable. Reward them. 
as much as you can. Sometimes in government it can't be money, but a praiseworthy thing, a nice letter. Go home if you're a leader and write them a nice letter. You have no idea how that will do. So if you work well, I write you a nice letter. How about that? <laughs> Leadership qualities. You must be curious. You must communicate well. All the things you're telling me about earlier. You must have character. Honesty, sir. Somebody said, but you must have courage. Ladies, you must have balls. <laughs> and if you're not like that, men, you must have balls more. You make them say you don't have none. What I mean, ladies and gentlemen, joke aside, is you must have backbone. If you're going to lead, you must be courageous. There are times, and I know Dr. Grace has been through it. Sorry to pick you out. But they pick me out all the time. I have a friend called Robbie Levy, who is the head of Jamaica Brothers. He said, when I was going through them, criticizing me for contractor general this and that. We just tell the contractor generally, I never hire myself. You go deal with whoever hire me. Um, <laughs> end of that. End of that. You know, hire myself. So, anyway, Robbie asked me, How you handle all this? So, I'm going to tell you and listen to this carefully. Your friends will never tell you the whole truth. No matter how good a friend they be. Exceptionally, one like me will tell the truth because if you hate me, I feel business. And at this stage in my life, I'm not looking for a friend. If we have a new friend, that's great. But really, your friend not going to tell you the whole truth. Your enemy is going to go after you. So this is how you deal with it. Treat every critic as an unpaid consultant. Every critic is an unpaid consultant. The bastard or the other term, which a gentleman like me would never use in public or private. <laughs> when Mrs. Bush was asked, what do you think of Geraldine Ferraro, who was running as vice presidential candidate against her husband, and she had said some terrible things about George uh, Herbert Bush, the father Bush. She says, what I think of her, what I think of her rhymes with witch. <laughs> so, 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 the bar, the bar says them come after me. I just say, look, but you must be introspective. You must know yourself. If it is true, learn from it, change, and run fast ahead. Three years later, they're still accusing for the same thing. You're gone. You have taken the consultancy and better yourself and gone. If it is not true because you have done your self-reflection, fling it away. But don't let criticism get you down. There was a term in Latin that was on Jimmy Hoffa's desk, who was the head of a, a union leader, and him get killed in the end. Um, it says, illegitimate illegit non cobarundum. Don't let the bastards grind you down. And the equivalent, Mrs. Bush's version. There are some of those too. Don't let them grind you down. So, what you have to do is to make sure that you take the criticism of a critic, learn from it, run ahead of it and be better for it. But don't let it get you down because your friends will never tell you the absolute truth. And that's the absolute truth. You must have conviction. You must have a measure of charisma. If you can't be charismatic like Michael Manley or uh, Chavez, okay? You notice I choose my words very carefully. Then if you can't be charismatic, you, can, you must be believable. So if you can't be charismatic, be, have be believability about you, and people will follow you. Um, competence. You must have some measure of competence. You must know, if I'm a financial guy, I must know how to do 
income analyze an income statement, do cash flows, do net present value, understand how to value a company. You must know those things. You must have a measure of competence. You must have common sense. Common sense. When them tell you something and them give you some highfalutin something from some university, you say, this is nonsense. And sometimes some ordinary taxi man give you foolishness to that also is nonsense. <laughs> okay. So from the taxi man to the university, if it makes sense, you take it. If it makes sense and nonsense, call it. So move on. Characteristics of a financial leader. Financial leader must understand and be comfortable with numbers. Be numerate. You tell all your students that. Get comfortable with numbers. Understand the, the income statement. Understand the balance sheet, which is now called the statement of financial con uh, position. Understand your cash flow. Even go to the point where you understand net present value. What is it? Your teachers, you've done math. If you haven't done math, get some more of it. It's well worthwhile. And frankly, when you start, you might find it fascinating. Digitize as much data as technologically, not just humanly. Not just humanly, I mean technologically. Push the technology to the end degree. Let me tell you something. If today I go to ask about how many times Garfield Sobers uh, fielded at Silmidon or in the sixth position, the statistician can tell me every single time in his test career. So why aren't you digitizing and, and making things numerate? Everything can be measured and everything can be digitized. So, so educators or people in the educational field get to the place where you're digitizing a lot more. Get younger people to help you and sometimes you know how to do it but you're not doing it, so do it. And I'm not talking about humanly possible, I'm talking about what is technologically possible. Now, how to control your own finances? We've gone from big, coming down to you. Try and improve your income. You're all well educated. There are lots of opportunities on the internet to improve your income. There are lots of opportunities growing up in our tourism center that you can improve your income. They, lots of people want to have craft things from Jamaica. Many of my friends come to Jamaica and say, I can't find anything to buy that Jamaican. Where are you going to make some? I remember my teacher, Mrs. Reed, at Top Hill Primary School in St. Elizabeth Third mentioned. Um, <laughs> used to have, Mrs. Reed used to make, make the kids make all kinds of crafts. And they were well received. So again, you can do that. But it's not just craft. It's the knowledge economy. Get into the knowledge economy where the money is. And you know something is hard currency? When you're working for overseas company, they don't know what they look like but then pay you good money because you have hard currency. Sorry, my, your machine is mixing up. My, there, there. I don't want Mr. Welch back. So, yes, that's where you go. Improve your income. Control your spending. You can't always control your income, but you can control your spending. You need to have, and don't spend what you don't have. Don't commit to spend what you can't spend. And don't make people feel that you have more money than you have. It's a bad business. Then we'll milk you like a cow, even if you're a man. <laughs> so we hear him laugh over here. So, so I better warn him. <laughs> save. You must save. Um, and. Pay yourself first. You'll see me on another slide of that later on. Control your borrowing. Control your borrowing. You can control what you spend and you control, can control what you borrow. Be careful. If money is easy, it's like that girl that my granny. When my granny said a girl was easy, Lord, she finished. No bother with her. When you see easy money, run. They them might trap you like, you see, I see China, them writing about China these days, how China trapped. Zambia, them take with Zambia Power Company and Zambia Broadcasting and them take with a port in Sri Lanka. Easy money, be careful. 
So up there big, you work for China and Sri Lanka, when they lend you too much, and you can't pay it back, they take it away. Same thing with you. Yeah. Especially your house, when you're now in your 60s and you can't afford to, to, to start all over again. Be careful. Collect your money. This is one that I really like. Collect money as early as possible. You owe me, give me the money now. <laughs> give me the money now. The present value, remember I told you about, I, remember I told you about the present value of money? The present value of money is that it must be present with me as soon as it has value. Exactly. Give me the money. <laughs> and I'm going to give you a true story. In the, in the late 90s, early 2000s, especially early 2000s. Remember the Dell computer? Well, Michael Dell, you used to have to pay for the computer like two or three weeks ahead of time because the demand was so great. Michael Dell, over that period of time, developed something that is called a negative receivable. A receivable is something that you owe me. Well, a negative receivable is money that I owe you, usually called a payable. But because you're buying something and I have to deliver it, they call it negative receivable. Michael Dell developed an amount of cash, almost like a bank, $28 billion in terms of negative receivables. So if you can get somebody to pay you for something before you deliver it, and you can turn that money, you're going to make a lot more money. So collect your money early. And not one day late. But pay as late as you can. <laughs> Don't worry, think that you're doing NCB any favor when you must pay on the 28th and you're paying all on the 25th. And you draw down your overdraft to pay. And nonsense. Pay on the 28th, but not on the 29th because they're going to charge you a late fee. <laughs> and them don't miss. I know them well. <laughs> <laughs> No, know your numbers if you're going to talk about financial management. Accuracy and speed. You don't want one without the other. You, want, you don't want to be speedy and everything may have to check five times. Me now work with you for long. You're gone. Finish. <laughs> you must be accurate, but you can't take forever to give me the stuff that I need. I have a deadline to meet. So both of them must go together. You must be accurate and you must have speed. Always double check. Just before you press send, double check. And sometimes these days, WhatsApp and my, 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 my smartphone key, and me think me check it, and the thing got changed, but it's something. And when you read it again, the, the, the wrong word it put in. Well, you have to say you have to be careful. Okay? Utilize data effectively. Get familiar with the data. Get used to it. Whether you're old or young or in between, get used to the data because the whole world is run on data usually zero and one in the computer. <laughs> Invest wisely. Coming now down to the end and more directly at you. Look on the board. Look on it carefully. Buy shares, buy shares, and buy shares again. When I came to take over NCB, the shares were 5.51, as it says. You know where the share is today? 105 today, it went up to 120 or 125 or some high number. Now you multiply that over the last 15 years or 14 years, and what investment you can get that can turn that to you? That is legal. I'm not talking about the other stuff that you <laughs> might be doing, but I'm talking about legal stuff. In this pharma, I must declare I'm on the board, so I'm not telling you to buy the share, I'm describing the data. As a, as a director, I can't tell you to buy any shares of any company I am on. But in this went to market at 1.5. It's now 3.75 or some number like that. In two months, Jamaica Brothers Group, again, I'm a director. I can't tell you to buy the shares. I'm just giving you the numbers. Maybe four years ago, the share was 4.5. Today, it's 31.5. Where can you make returns like that? So please buy shares. Get used to buying. And every month you must buy some. I mean, I mean, you have to buy 50 million or even 50,000. 
5,000, you're 25 now? Start with the young people like me. Tw you're 25 now? You have no idea how much you're going to worth when you're 35 if you keep buying some shares every month. Just buy good shares. Buy some new ones as well, because the new ones give you a kicker. So you, take, you make a little pie and put, make it your risk chart. On my least risky, depending on if the money is devaluing or not, you, can, you have your cash. Then you're, you have government securities. Don't buy much of that, because that's not going to make you much. But you, want, you might want some in when your later years. The way you're going to get wealthy is through shares. And let me tell you something. You can all talk about start your business. Until you start the business, go buy shares in people who run their company well. Start, com you know, you know how 80% of the new startups fail. Put your money and go buy shares in companies who run, people who run it well. Buy shares, not only here. If you had bought Google 10 years ago, what would you be worth today? One share. One. So go and buy shares. I can't say it enough. Buy shares regularly. Oh, I didn't say it enough. <laughs> Save regularly. Pay yourself first. Every time you get paid, take out your tithe. I recommend that you tithe. 10% for the Lord. And if you're really rich, 15% won't hurt you either. Find somebody to help. There are always people out there who the Lord will, will want you to help as an angel. Go help them. And after that, pay yourself well. The next money is for you. Take out the money and save. But now go put it in a bank. A little bit. You need to have some cash. Buy shares. <laughs> <laughs> then buy other income producing assets. You need to have some probably real estate. If you're young, teacher and you're saving your money, buy a small 10 million house, rent it out. Another five years, 10 years, you move up, you rent that out. And by the time you buy the third house, clear, you, have, you, you rent it out to Japanese embassy, wholly for foreign currency. That's why you asked me to come up here. And it's not a joke. May I smile to get the message across, but I'm deadly serious. Go follow it. Leaders, ah, you must, we talk about honesty. You have to have ethics. You should have a moral compass. You see me have up there Buddha, Ganesh, Jesus. And if you're like Bill Clinton and you have a weakness for money, power, and sex, all three at the same time, you're going to get impeached by the house. But 34 senators say, uh-uh, this is not how you move a president. It must be for high crime and misdemeanor. And that most of them are men, you know how that go? He stayed president. <laughs> but I'm saying to you, you must have a moral compass. Many of you talked about honesty, and it's not just for women, it's for men too. Critical triad. The body, intellect, and the spirit. We dress up the body. We exercise the body. We bling the body. Make it pretty, whatever we think. Or we make it naked. Some of the things I might see at dance hall. I mean, I know what that is, but you know, not my thing. But there are people who buy it, so you know, them buy it. <laughs> so you will look after the body. You in here are educators, or in the educational business. We train the intellect. We stretch it. We never stop. In fact, I will never stop learning. Lord helps me and I don't have Alzheimer's, never stop learning. So we look after the intellect, but the spirit, we don't want to talk about it. No, man, we don't want to talk about Jesus and God or what my faith is and so on. Well, let me tell you something. No matter how strong you are physically, no matter how intellectually erudite you are, when things hit you and you have to go on your knees, only the spirit will help you. You don't look after your spirit. You're not getting anywhere when you're in serious trouble. Amen. You understand that. So as you look at management, you can't lead unless you let them know and they don't have to follow you. 
This is where I stand. And if you're going to lead, you must stand somewhere. So you must make sure the triad is taken care of, the body, the intellect, and the spirit. When one is out of kilter, the person becomes unbalanced, and we see lots of unbalanced people. They take care of the body, they don't bother with the spirit, usually it's the spirit, or they don't bother with intellect, although they have talent, mash up themselves. One leader style, consultative leadership style, this is what my colleagues at the EGC said, so you can take it for what it is. Some agree and some not agree. Cultivate a culture where employers can input their own views and ideas. We have stand-up meetings, and I did it at NCB, I did it wherever I run. Usually we have stand-up meetings, what do you think, Cordell, what do you think, Dennis, what's your point? And we, we don't have, we don't spend hours going on, we get to the point. Sometimes you have to spend longer time, depending on the issue. Um, while the leader must make the final decision, information from his team allows for a more informed decision to be made. The leader, and this is not political leadership, unfortunately, for the most part, democratic political leadership is consultative and it is consensual. The prime minister makes a decision. He's met four, three or four of his ministers. And the ministers walk out and get a call from a very important person, the party or government or from overseas, and him half a change again. Isn't that because he's a liar? Things change. He is he's mainly a political leader at the top, is a consensual leader. Something has happened that will affect that decision, and if I go through it, it is disaster. I have to adjust. Ask the minister. I have to do it all the time. The leader, so political and corporate leadership is different. There's money power, and many people who, are, who have money believe them can run the power until the man who has the power tell him it's me have the power. But tell Trump you can run his business. I wish you well. You can have money till you're tired. All China just a learn center, so it go. Oh, we have 1.3 trillion invested in the United States. Yeah, where are you going to put it? All right, take it out of the United States. Where are you going to put it? Germany? The German economy can't handle it. You're going to put it in Britain, it's smaller than, than India. Where are you going to put it? Only one, the United States of America. So political power is different from financial power. Those who have financial power want to tell the political powers what to do. If the political powers are bright, they say, no, no, no. You know how many votes you got? All right. <laughs> and if you're a leader, you must have a push for excellence. Don't lower the, 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 the bar. Keep it high. Some people are going to press, but you know something? When you press them and they get better, five years, ten years later, they come back to you and say, I didn't believe I could do it. I remember a guy, Leonard, from Sri Lanka, who now works for NCB in, 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 in England, run NCB business here. He said, Mr. Hill, you came and recruited me from Sri Lanka. You have pushed me to things that I never thought was possible. Then do it. Lead your people to go forward higher. Thank you. Senator Hill, I am. I, I don't know what to say. This is this is rich. This is this is rich. Um, I don't know that there is that we can express it any other way, you know? And I know that the questions are coming and, and before we, we, we move the vote of thanks, I'm going to ask Mr. Burbick at this time to take over, to take um, Senator Hill through the question and answer session and, and then we will have Dr. McLean. But the, the minister had to go um, because okay. of to cabinet because of previous engagements, but we just really want to express our, our gratitude to him for being here and, and, and just leading at the highest level. Um, colleagues, could you give him a hand? He was here from 345, and that for me is exceptional leadership coming from the top. Mr. Burbick, it's your time to take over. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Ingerton, and I do share your sentiments in saying that this has been very rich. 
so rich i think we could pass around the collection plate you know collect a good <laughs> offering and just call it an evening indeed but <laughs> some burning questions or perhaps just for um senator hill to reiterate a couple of points before we wrap up this evening and i'll start the ball rolling but feel free indicate and i'll take your questions as we progress with the discussion and i see the hands already but let me set the tone a bit, and then we'll open the floor for further questions. Um, Senator Hill, one of the things you pointed out um, as one of your examples is that movement um, in, 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 or the improvement in the Jamaican economy from 147% debt to GDP ratio in 2013, and I think we're projected to end at about 105 by the end of this. Well, we're down um, to 102 at the end of the last financial year. Mm -hmm. And by the, by the time we get to March next year, we should be below 100. But what are the lessons to be learned there? Because, I mean, coming from the era of doom and gloom prior to that, to now hearing we're heading to below 100%, what are the lessons to be learned there, not just for us as a country, but for us as individuals in this room? The, con the lesson to be learned here is that, A, you have to pay down your debt. Um, when it gets, first of all, the first lesson, as I said before, don't let your, get, your debt get too high. Manage it. Control what you borrow. We didn't do that very well, and so we had to pay them a tremendous price. Now, the lesson is when you borrow too much and you can't pay, people take step with you. Let me tell you something. I'm sorry. Dr. Phillips is on the other side, political side. But I'm really sorry for the things that he had to go through at the IMF. I have a good idea how those people can be. You think bastard is a, is a bad word? That's a nice word as to how he would have been te treated for the place Jamaica was. So um, people take a step with you, so don't get there. Uh, the, banks, the banks, when they offer you the money, they love you and they give you everything. And then when you can't pay, they cost you all kind of dirty words. Okay? So be careful of that. But also, while you're paying down your debt, one of the lessons that I want Jamaica to learn and Jamaicans to learn is that you can't just look at paying down your debt. You have to find a way. Let me use a Jamaican word, another way to hustle, to find a way to earn additional income. Otherwise, you're going dead. Because the, the money not, money not enough, as, as Bob Marley said. Money not enough. So we have to find a way to make sure, even as you do that, and these days, teachers, educators, people in the education sphere, there are lots of avenues that you can use legally uh, and to get hard currency. Use that internet. Find a way. And I don't mean go overseas alone. You know, you can sell things on the internet here. I see a lady today send me an internet uh, message to say, look, uh, buy, come buy my vegetables at such and such a date in Manchester. Who would think that people would be selling vegetables in, in, on, on the internet and not go to Coronation Market or some market, Linstead Market. So there you go. Make sure you understand, don't borrow too much. When you have your debt, you have to pay it down. Paying it down it alone is not enough. You have to find ways to get additional income, which Jamaica is now trying to do. The reality, though, is as, as Jamaicans, we tend to be a lot um, numbers averse. Yes. We don't like math. We struggle with our math scores in the education system. And I think that is reflected in sometimes the, the, the personal struggles we have in terms of money ma management in our lives. And one of the things you talked about was um, you cannot leapfrog poverty without knowledge. What's a soft landing pad or a, or, or a good place to start for the average individual who may think, you know, this whole money management thing, I know me really. Where's a good source that I can go to to start building that kind of, uh, of knowledge base? I'll tell you this. Um, I, I was a, a quite good student at Monroe, and I like many things. I have a curious, strong curiosity. Um, but I really loved uh, geography. I did well in math and the rest of the stuff, but I really loved geography. Start with something you love. Go find something that you really like to do and make it good enough for, and say, look, you should have some of this. I made it. And by the way, as you're having it, it's just, in, all I'm selling it for is for $15,000. Them they think it's free, you know. 
but you drop the 15,000 on them, but them tell you they like it already. So you now you might have to negotiate down to 12, but it's 12 more than you got before. So what you have to do is, the issue of numbers is important. So if it is important, treat it like I treat medicine. The doctor tell me, say, I have to take this medicine. Luckily, it's not, 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 I don't have to take any these days. But if you tell me, say, I have to take my when I get a hurt, you have to take cataflan. I take the cataflan like religious. And if you pay me belly, I eat yogurt. Or I'm giving me some one other medicine to, to neutralize it. What, what's the one? Zantac. Give me Zantac to sort it out. How you mean? We want the pain solved. So please understand. If math is like a little bit of paint, you get some help. Ask somebody, no get no shame. If you don't know something, and you ask somebody, and them think you are idiot, I feel them problem that you are idiot if you don't ask. So if you need some help with math, there's somebody who will help you, and you, you even get a banker to, to talk to you about it. Show that you have an interest, and when people see that you have an interest, even Dr. McLean will help you, and no matter how busy she is. <laughs> okay, so go, that's where you go about the numbers. Get used to it, and you're in the education business. Don't make it be a phobia. Just take it on. We had a hand over on that side. Yes. Good evening, everyone. I don't have a question. You saved my life today. As a matter of fact, Ensel, yes. I am originally from Guyana. Um, I came here at 17, and I have been operating my school for the last 21 years. So I don't answer to anybody. I answer to myself. <clears throat> but I have made mistakes. And for some reason, um, Ensel contacted me, and I must thank them for the opportunity for being here. I live in Mandeville. And trust me, this is information that I can take back to my little school and make it work. Hear, hear. Give her a round of applause. That's wonderful. Wonderful. You were talking about countries with um, economic problems. You know Guyana. I know Guyana. You know. I know this story. All right. So, I mean, listening to you and being a leader and... Even the minister was talking about PEP. We can put PEP in the light of finances, you know, deal with it that has it as it needs to be dealt with so we can move forward. And I thank you very, very much. Dr. Ingleton, trust me, you guys saved my life today. Thank oh, you. Oh, wonderful. A round of applause for all the people who put this together. Yes. She, my, my, I'm from Mandeville as well. <laughs> Just thought I'd slip that in. But she touched on an interesting point, and it's that of um, being an entrepreneur. Right. And sometimes I think, as an entrepreneur, we say, you know, I'm my own boss. I call the shots. But how important is accountability to the entrepreneur to ensure that, you know, some of the things you'd probably not take for granted if you were employed to someone else, that you probably say, okay, you know, I, I don't have to pay the bill on the, on the I, day. I, yeah, I, I, can, I, can, I can push this one to next month. And I before you know it, 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 it starts something that you, you're struggling to contain. I don't like to sit down. I play tennis. <laughs> I love tennis. I play four or five times a week. Tennis, and I love to play singles. That means I'm on my side of the court. My, the issue is... When the ball is on my side of the court, I'm in jeopardy. My job is to get the ball back over the net, inside the line, and put the pressure on you. The pressure of being accountable as an entrepreneur is one that you will always face. I am a mentor to many, many people. Some of them you would be surprised. They're going into big employment contract here and overseas, they call me because I've had that experience. You must find a way to get somebody to help you make yourself accountable. And uh, that's not easy. Uh, if you're self-motivated, if you're a golfer, you have to push yourself.
But I tell you something. The best golfer, Tiger Woods is back, but take your pick. Federer in tennis. Nadal in tennis. Osaka and Williams in tennis. Every single one at the highest level has a coach. Why? Because I'll tell you, I play tennis, and I have a good forehand as a left-hander, and I have a great, great serve, they tell me, at my level at club, as a left-hander, because I serve across the court. And sometimes it doesn't work. And no matter what you do and how much you know, and somebody who understands tennis, just see it and say, I remember I was playing the other day, and, and Lockett McGregor, the coach, just passed by. He said, Mr. Hill, I just want to say something to you. You're taking the ball too far back. You must take the ball. And the rule in tennis, all tennis balls are hit sideways. And you must take the ball in front of you, not here. In front of you is never here in tennis. You serve here, you hit the ball here, fall over your shoulder. So it's in front of you. And I was taking it back. That means you're putting too much pressure on your arm, and you don't have the power that you should have. And just one movement. And my friend Norman is saying, hey, you're hitting the ball differently. I didn't say a word to him. <laughs> I didn't say a word to Lockett. So please understand, as much as you can, every now and again, check in with somebody who you respect and who cares for you, and say, look, this is what I'm doing. What do you think? Or two or three, quietly. So don't die in your, by yourself. Get some help. Get some mentorship. Yes, sir. Done? Uh, <laughs> I'm not. We could go all evening. <laughs> One of the things you mentioned is, is income producing assets, and you mentioned um, real estate. Yes. As one of As them. one. No, sh no. Shares, 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 and shares. Shares, And then shares, buy shares, shares regularly. Buy and shares then buy regularly. some real estate. <laughs> and then buy some real estate. For those of us interested in producing assets a bit more, what are some of the others that we may want to consider? I pick on those two. Uh, uh, class of assets. I mean, uh, you have bonds. Um, people like Sajikor and NCB and the government sell bonds. Um, you have a, usually people who, are, who tend to be um, a little bit more mature or pension funds who want a consistent amount of money every year to pay out as pension. Uh, they want to have that uh, annuity kind of payment. So they will take bonds. That's another way to look at it. But for income producing, um, it's usually, it's going to be equities. And equities across borders, um, real estate. Please, for heaven's sake, if you don't have to buy the second car, don't buy it. It's not a producing asset. And if you don't have to buy the expensive Audi, buy something else. You don't need, nobody don't need to see you have no Audi <laughs> or BMW. Except, of course, if you're my wife. Because I can come out here and give you all the advice I want. <laughs> Next. <laughs> and following on that same topic of shares, we have a question from our online audience. Yes. Um, Two-part question. First part being, how do you decide where to buy shares? And when would be a good time to buy shares, given that they fluctuate in value? All right. The, the, well, like anything else that you're going to do, you should do some study. Do some homework. And the internet today, you know, I mean, I was, as I said, I was in St. Elizabeth, and we were clearing out um, uh, part of our basement. And I had all these files with, with articles from the Wall Street Journal and the Financial Times from the 80s, and they've been bothering my wife for year, forever. And I said, tomorrow you can throw them all out. I can Google anything I want now. I don't need those files anymore. So she gets all this space. She's happy over the moon. And I have Google. <laughs> I have Google on my phone. I have Google. I don't need anything else. So I know today I was Googling, I think, the 36th president of the United States to talk about bureaucracy. So I don't need all those files. You don't need a whole heap of stuff. You can go and study E-Trade. You can study how to trade. Google will tell you everything. And then you can ask intelligent questions from somebody who is a practitioner. 
uh, at JMMB or NCB or SAGICOR. Make them, them get hold of money, make them answer your question. Okay, so go to them and ask them questions when you want, especially tell them you're going to open an account. Now, if you have hold per question, what to do? You're going to say, hey, I'm going to open an account, and then give it a paper, and you ask them 10 questions, say, oh, I have to go home and discuss it with my <laughs> wife. You know, I have no wife, you know, or no husband. So, you, you, but you, you go home, and, 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 you, and you come back the next day and say, I have some more questions. <laughs> so, so, really and truly, start before, how do you, where do you buy? You buy in developed markets, markets that are transparent, markets that give you a lot of information, like the Jamaica Stock Exchange. The Jamaica Stock Exchange is very, very well run. I support it, and the junior market's very well run. Uh, we have managed ourselves very well. The New York Stock Exchange, of course, is the mothership of all stock markets. And you can do that on E-Trade and all kinds of, you don't have to go, but you're gonna have to get your data in place, right. And then you check out, and if you're trading on the New York Stock Exchange, all the data is there. You can see everything about the company for 5, 10, 15 years. So it's a, and that's why I recommend shares, because uh, there's a lot of information, not nearly as much information with real estate or something else. We have a question in the front. Good evening, sir. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, it is. it is. It is. <laughs> My question is on the macroeconomic level. Yes. Um, and you sit on the Economic Growth Council. I am supposed to run it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Being that Jamaica has been in a per perpetual state of debt. Yes. And uh, we, we as citizens, when we look around, we are not seeing much evidence of growth, of prosperity, even though there is talk about that. I would like to know what are some of the things that your council is looking at in terms of um, being the best ways in which Jamaica or the best kind of industries and ventures that Jamaica can enter into to come out of this situation and what are the projections? When I was working with the, uh, voluntarily incidentally, uh, as, the, as the chair of the then leader of the opposition's Economic Advisory Council, I created something called the Growth Triangle. At the top is water, on the right hand side is housing, the left hand side is, on the left hand side was housing, on the right hand side is energy. Those are the things that will drive your economy. Funnily enough, why is water at the top? You can't build a building unless you get water approval. You can't grow agriculture consistently unless you have water irrigation system. So, and so two of the main things that will drive growth, water is the link. So you have housing. Housing is a low hanging fruit. I use housing as, a, as a, a proxy for construction because you can employ a lot of people. You don't have to have PhDs to work in that, that industry. Uh, and so you, money gets spread around quickly. There's one exception, I want to point that out. When, when we deal with check, and it's not a criticism, it's just a fact. Check is a government-to-government -government arrangement. Check brings in its equipment and its money and everything, and most of the money goes back out. So the multiplier effect, when you pay check, the money goes back to China. When you pay many of the Chinese workers who work with check, the money goes to China. So the multiplier effect is not nearly as good as Airbnb. Airbnb in Manchester and Trench Town. Whole for white people and white picnic down there, a trench down. Them come to get the, the Bob yeah. Marley experience, and nobody no trouble them. And them spend them hard currency, and the money go to the shopkeeper and to the teacher for to pay for the school fee, and the multiplier effect, as we talk about in economics, happens. So that's the growth triangle. And then I expanded it to put on agriculture, which is so important, and cutting the red tape in government. If we don't cut the red tape in government, whether it's in education or Ministry of Economic Growth or NEPA or wherever it is, you cannot get the synergy that you need. For instance, you, the building permit takes too long and NEPA can't get it done, so the building just starts, the people not getting work. So you need to cut through that. So on the right hand side of my growth triangle is cutting government red tape. Agriculture is key. 
2016 second quarter, when agriculture grew by 28%, the, econo the economy of the country grew by 2.4%. Agriculture no grow, we can't grow. Still vitally important. So I'm working with Minister Shaw to make sure all that land that we have in Cain is given to agriculture. Incidentally, I want you to go home and Google something, or Google it from here, called Wegmans, W-E-G-M-A-N-S. It's a supermarket service owned by a billionaire who, is, who has a long association with Jamaica and has houses at trial. Wegmans have just been putting, last year they sold 800,000 pounds of papayas. 400,000 pounds came from Jamaica. And they're looking to expand. Remember one time we had big papaya, it's now they're looking to expand. They have now introduced, they love the Simmons Pier. They opened a major store in, 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 uh, in Philadelphia, in, in Pennsylvania yesterday. And somebody sent me back the picture of Jamaican papayas, Jamaican Simmons pears, right there in Wegmans. Now, you talk about additional income. And you never think of growing avocado. It is one of the best agricultural crops in the world. Everybody wants avocado. Mm -hmm. And we have one of the best pear. Go to the agricultural center, you macroeconomics woman, <laughs> go there. <laughs> and get the avocado pear Simmons and find out how to grow it well. And yesterday, or two, for the opening yesterday, I think they sent off two containers of avocados. I bet you never know that. Good prices, hard currency. There are ways to improve your income. Agriculture is the place to go. The government has land that they will, you can lease for nothing. Get together and put some of your friends together. Listen to me, one of the best invention of Western capitalism is called the limited liability company. You limit your liability and you share your assets to make a company work. Go form a limited liability, some of you and your friend and your family. Sometimes you go and quarrel, so to form a good limited liability company and the shares are yours. Them can quarrel till them tired. <laughs> okay. So form a limited liability company and get into, find out what the world, Wegmans will want all the papayas you can grow and all the avocados you can grow and other things as well. Uh, people who grow pistachio and almonds in California coming here to do or or orchard crops like mangoes and avocados. We have one burning question, which will be our last, and then we'll put a wrap on this evening. Okay, great. Thanks for taking this question. Yes. We are all educators here, and you would have gotten, I guess, indicated to the leadership of education how they should and must manage their school plant. However, how does this transcend down towards the student level? Because if the students are not well versed in financial literacy, it is not going to eventually ensure that they live within their means, they do not borrow outside of their means, that they save and they invest, invest, invest. So how do we start at that student level to build that sort of mindset so that we get that five in four that we want how many years later down the line? No, 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 not many years, we have a lot. With your fancy accent, no bother with that. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Um, but since we're educators here, it's almost a rhetorical question. You take this, what Jack Welch said, what I've said, and say, how do I know? And get your students in, involved. Say, look, you need to know about money. How do you, what do you want to know about it? And some of them will tell you some interesting questions. And you have some ideas, and you have your ideas about your friends. First of all, I can tell you something. There will be some schools that do this thing very well. Go find them. Don't worry, change the model. Copy it, lock, stock, and barrel. <laughs> and adjust it for Moko. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
but take it. In other words, communicate, guys. We have chat groups now. If you're, in, if you're doing math well and you're teaching financial education well, share it and say, look, we're doing this well. I, what are you doing? Can we exchange? So it, it's now your responsibility. Somebody like me can reach so many of you, and then you reach another 40 and another 20. And that's how it goes. But don't leave here today and don't make a commitment to teach your students. She's absolutely right. No worry, just treat, teach yourself. Go and teach your students now and say you need to understand about money. And every week or every three days you tell them something about money. That is interesting. Don't make it be boring. Let it be interesting. Something happened overseas and said this is what money is doing. Because you're educating yourself yourself as well because you have to do the work. That sounds like it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Permanent Secretary, Dr. Ingleton, our esteemed lecturer. Can I call him a lecturer? Yes, indeed. This afternoon, Senator Aubin Hill. And of course, uh, Mr. Burbick. Ladies and gentlemen, I, let me just start. I'm so emotional this evening because a senator spoke about mind, no, he spoke about body, intellect, and spirit. And of course, many of us really peers prepare the body very well. And the intellect, as a matter of fact, we gravitate towards that. That is why we have so many doctors in the ministry, sir. <laughs> But the spirit component really connected with me because, again, it is our being. And I, I, from a spiritual perspective, sometimes when we get into these public places, we are afraid to declare and to say that is what keeps us uh, going. And you actually connected with quite a few other things that you spoke about in terms of how you take medication, for example, and how you follow the rules. And so the last question that was asked by Anel, who is from IDB, sir, oh. so she would be very concerned about how what we are doing, how that is actually reaching to our students. It has resonated with me because what Senator has shown us is that what we do doesn't necessarily has to be packaged in a particular way, in a written curriculum, and you say that you're going to be teaching financial literacy. You would have noted that his slides were very, were powerful points, short and effective, and so he utilized his intellect, his expertise, to ensure that he brought home the important points. And that is what is expected of us educators, because in a few short years, our young people will be taking over from us. So that is a very good note for us to ensure that we are passing on what we are learning to our students by using best practices. We teach our children that when they look at somebody else's paper, they are copying, but as we, we move into the adult world and into business, then we talk about best practices, adopting and adapting the best practices. <laughs> so again, we have to start, and that is really, when we speak about our critical thinking skills, one which is collaboration, that is what we are expected to do while being ethical, of course, because the spirit is important, that's what we are expected to do. So Senator, I tell you, sir, you have certainly stimulated my intellect because the nature of the job that we do today, and as uh, Dr. Ingleton will say, when you, have, when you have earned yourself a PhD, you must continue writing and researching. So you provided perhaps the second lesson for me for 2018, which I will really have to now look to see, Dr. Ingleton, how we can advance in terms of the papers that we write from time to time. You have really stimulated us, sir. You started out by speaking about the incrementalizing of, uh, incrementalizing will not make us leapfrog. And so we will not be able to remove ourselves from poverty if we're going to be talking about incremental growth. We have to leapfrog if we want to see the growth within our country. The, the, the thoughts you presented as it relates to the 
IMF uh, situation relating to our country and the 7.5% surplus and the 60 billion uh, worth of taxes that would have been mandated and the IMF not focusing on growth, but that is something that we must do. And also your actual other scenario with the NWC and really the approach that is currently being used is really thought provoking and I'm sure doing maybe you're the doing that comes on television by the way sir okay you look you look a little differently this afternoon I'm sure you may want to look at that uh, carefully and I believe senator that as a country we really need to look at FM 101 which is financial management 101 across the length and breadth of this country. Thank you for reminding us about what Jack Welch has said. I believe this idea about being the chief fund officer is a very good one, sir, because I something that I would like to adopt <laughs> and adapt. But, sir, it's going to be very difficult, I'll have to tell you. But it is worth considering because if you love what you do, you will do it better. Now, it, our senator did not only focus on what we are to do in our professional lives. I spoke about the spirit and intellect and so on. But he also spoke about how we should manage our lives. So we are to pay later and we are to collect early. That's very important. And we are to buy shares and buy shares and buy shares and buy shares and buy shares again. And when you can't buy any more shares, you must go, on, go on out to real estate. So he's a veteran from his experience. He's telling us what we must do to ensure that as educators, because, sir, educators, we are not usually good financial managers. As a matter of fact, the education system started out with instructional leadership. Everything has now become sophisticated. And so we have to teach our principals, our boards, how to manage a financial enterprise. It's not, no longer only about instructional leadership. So, sir, you have given us the full package. And it has certainly been my honor and my privilege to sit down there and listen to you. If I'd sat up here, I would have to be more concerned about how I'm sitting and how I'm looking, sir. So I was able to sit at the back and ensure that I got in every single word that you have said. And I know that you would not have disappointed us, but you have exceeded our expectations. It's one... It's one of those evenings, sir, when I have to say that I have been touched, moved, and inspired. And I am sure all the persons here can say the same thing. And one of us may have been brave enough to say that he has saved your life. But I am sure many of us can say the same thing because we have things to take home to discuss with our wives and our husbands, even when we don't have them. <laughs> and to decide how we are going to be moving forward. So we thank you, sir. And Dr. Ingleton, we really look forward to the packaging of this information so we can share with all our school leaders. It was done in such an interactive and comfortable way that will really allow for this to be easy for us to watch and for us to do even some little clips and see how we can continue to educate our people. P.S., thank you for welcoming us, sir. Thank you also, our minister, who has left um, for challenging us with uh, his PEP questions. The PEP challenge continues to be what is going to be trending, certainly for this, uh, this school year. And how can I not thank the team, Dr. Hing Ingleton, and the team from NCEL? You have done a remarkable job. And Senator, I have to tell you, sir, Dr. Ingleton is one who is able to take up someone who seem not to be going anywhere to brush them off, fix them up, and they behave as if they were just born. She has that capacity. And I saw the examples of some of the young people that we see working around her. And so she is a leader that understands, sir, that it starts stinking from the head. And so she does not allow that to happen. And we are certainly inspired by her leadership. Ladies and gentlemen, we want to thank you very much for being here. Those who are here physically, some persons would have left, but also our listeners from Canada, 
France, the USA, the British Virgin Island, as well as Trinidad, and perhaps others that may have joined us. We have certainly had a stimulating evening, and I would like for us to leave here this evening as certified ambassadors as it relates to effective financial management and leadership as we seek to build this country. Have a good evening. Thank you so very much, Dr. McLean, for that. That was amazing, colleagues. Indeed, this is a great evening. But before we close, I really just want to introduce to the room and to our online um, watchers and listeners the team from the National College. Could you just join me, please? All the members of the National College for Educational Leadership, could you just come up here? All of you, Mr. Clark at the back, please come. Everybody, this is the team, colleagues, a team of young people, but they are innovative. They are critical thinkers. They are agile. They are flexible. They are impressive. They are spontaneous. These are individuals who stand tall within the education system, ensuring that our leadership development approaches are not static. They are the ones who are continually saying, look, Dr. Ingleton, we have to reach a different kind of audience. We have to do different things. We have to find ways to make leadership development be out there in the faces of people. These are the people, colleagues. Could you just please help me to congratulate them all? They are amazing. And P.S., P.S., we are blessed to have them at the Ministry of Education. Thank you. Yes. See them there. Everybody can see them. Awesome people indeed. Um, colleagues, this is the last um, webinar for the year. We will start again in January. We had seven this year, and we are taking a break, and we're going to be looking back at our operational plan and our, and, and our strategic plan and see um, what else is it that we, we need to do to build capacity within the system. We are now writing our seven-year report called 10 Levers for Transforming Educational Leadership in Jamaica. You need to see that report. It's going to be hot off the press. Tuesday, October 2, because UCJ is coming for registration, and we have to show that off, okay? And so we will find a way to get it out to other members of the ministry and individuals who are here with us online and so on. So thank you so very much for being here. We have refreshment, and it's a lot of food. So please ensure that you have as much as you want before you leave and thank you, colleagues, for being so supportive to us as we try to create world-class educational leaders. I thank you. Thank you.